Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar sponsored and presented by MAPE, entitled Water, Subfloor Moisture Control and Surface Prep for Wood Flooring Installation. My name is Sharon Schaller, the Member Engagement Manager at NWFA, and I will serve as your moderator for today's webinar. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few technical housekeeping items. You should see a control panel on your screen in the upper right corner. You are listening in using your computer speaker system by default, and therefore the computer audio button is selected. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select phone call in the audio pane, and then the dial-in information will be displayed. But when you call in, be sure to enter your PIN number so you can properly participate. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing in your text questions into the chat box of your control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during this presentation, but we will collect and address them during the Q&A session at the end of MAPE's presentation today. So before we begin the presentation, we have a poll question for you, which is the one we do every time we do this. So I'm going to launch that. And the question is, what is your NWFA member business type? And the options are contractor, inspector, distributor, manufacturer, or retailer. So please select the appropriate response and click Submit. And if by chance you don't see your type there, then just put it in the chat box for us. I'll just leave it open for a few more seconds. And I've got the majority of you, so I'll close that and share it. And what do we have? We have 45% of you are inspectors, followed by 34 contractors, 9% manufacturers, 7% distributors, and 5% retailers. So thanks so much for participating in that poll for us. And now I would like to introduce our presenter for today's webinar. Sam Biondo directs the MAPE Technical Institute's three U.S. branches, which provide training for contractors and distributors and the A&D community. Sam has over 25 years of international experience in the flooring industry, encompassing all aspects of flooring installations. A popular speaker at many industry functions, including our own NWFA Expo, Sam's expertise helps his audiences easily comprehend new and innovative technologies. So Sam, I'm gonna unmute you, and then I'm gonna give you presenter control. And if you would share your screen, we are ready to begin. All right, how's that? Sounds great, Sam, thank you. Can you see everything? Yep. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I didn't realize I love my marketing department. They wrote a really nice introduction for me. So I was like, who are they talking about when she was asking me <laughs> all those things? <laughs> Everybody who took the time um, to listen today, thank you so much. I know how valuable time is. You can't get it back. And once it's gone, it's gone. So thanks for taking the time. It says a lot about who you are and about what you want to be. Um, so again, beforehand, thank you very much. Um, this is a really um, passionate subject for me. Um, if you don't know anything about me, I grew up in South Florida. I worked in South Florida. My installs have been in South Florida. And from about 1984 on, I started doing wood floors in South Florida. Um, my very first floor that I ever did wood floor was a Harco Pattern Plus floor, glue down over third grade sheet goods upside down, because that's the way we did it in 1984-85. And, um, you know, water and wood were always a big issue in South Florida. Um, we kind of had to learn the hard way on how to deal with things. We tried gluing floors down with epoxy. We tried gluing thick floors down with water-based adhesives until we figured it out, until we figured out what was going on scientifically. And this is kind of a subject that all of us have probably talked about at nauseum, but you can never hear enough, and it's always good to hear other people's perspectives. So with that, I'll just get on with the presentation and share what I know. And, and I always say I don't know everything, but everything I know, I'm willing to share with you guys. And please type in your questions, and I will get back with you, I promise you. So let's get on with the presentation. 
Um, first things first, it's introduction to moisture. Look, see, the biggest myth that there is about moisture is that water and wood don't mix. And that's not necessarily true. Christopher Columbus came over here on a boat made out of wood. Um, your outdoor deck is made out of wood. It's unexpected loss or gain of water that's a problem. We built basketball courts out of maple in buildings that did not have air conditioning for years and years and years, um, but the floor system knew that's what it was going to be. When we turned the air conditioner on in the room, things got a little weird. So you've got to let the wood acclimate to the environment that it's going to be in. And there's a couple of reasons why, and we'll go over those. Um, first things first, um, you need to understand some of the learning objectives here today. You know, water and trees, what type of water, understanding moisture, alkalinity, and the effects on concrete slabs. Um, we don't really get into this as, as much as we probably should. The impact of vapor emissions, why vapor emissions causes floors to fail, how moisture and mold can impact the health of a building, what is dry versus cured, and of course the testing, calcium chloride tests and RH testing. Um, I, I'm not going to get into the pros and cons of that. I, I leave that up to manufacturers and I leave that up to individuals. Um, you got to go with what you're comfortable with and and also, one of the things when we talk about what type of testing to do, are you the installer, are you the homeowner, are you the general contractor? Um, if I'm the installer, quite frankly, and I'm slamming down floors, I just need to know today what's going on. Um, it, can I put the floor in, yes or no? Um, but if I'm the homeowner or the contractor, I'm concerned about the life of the floor and, and, and things like that. So it's just all a matter of perspective as far as I'm concerned. Understanding water, it comes in three forms, a liquid, a solid, and a gas. I don't think that gets brought up enough. Um, basically, from all of my research, there is a tiny, 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 minuscule amount of water that leaves planet Earth. Um, I really scientifically tried to understand how it happens. It has something to do with radiation and ions, and it shoots up into space somehow. But the reality is we live in a big giant terrarium and this water just moves around in different forms. Um, I'm not exact on the numbers, but about 90% of the water on earth is ocean water. Um, the rest is, is, is what we are concerned with as human beings, potable water, water we can possibly drink. And I always tell everybody when you're mixing products with water, never mix a product with water you can't drink. Um, and I'm, I'm going to make a few confessions. As an ex-installer, I have mixed with pond water and lake water. I've done some things I'm, I'm rather technically ashamed of, but I did get them done and I did get the job done. And fortunately, I didn't get a call back. So I'm not advocating that. I want everyone to understand that, but I also want you to understand that I understand. Um, the water cycle, and I think this is important that we understand, it's all based on the loss or gain of heat. So, for instance, um, you got a lake. The, the sun heats up the lake water. As it, get, as it picks up heat and generates heat, it, con it converts to a vapor. The vapor rises up in the air, and it gets so high up in the air that it's in the atmosphere, and it cools down. Now, loss of heat. When that happens now, it condenses back together into a water droplet and then it freezes and it starts falling back down to the ground because the ground at a certain elevation is warm. We lose more heat and now that ice or that, that snowflake converts itself back to a water droplet and falls back in the lake. This thing just constantly recycles that way. So ocean water is rising up into the air and converting it to, I live in South Florida. In the summertime, every day at three o'clock, it's the same thing. The sun heats up all the water around us. The vapor rises up in the air. The wind blows the clouds over top of my head. And at about three o'clock to five o'clock, it rains. And then it does it all over again the next day. And it's just this big giant cycle. So that's what's going on with water and how it's moving through. It's in three different states that it moves through our environment. When it comes to wood and water, it's a combination, a situation is you just need to understand and prepare your floor system or whatever system it is, um, that what, how much water it's going to be exposed to. Let's go back to a wood deck. 
um, I'm going to leave a gap in between each board because A, I want that water to drain off as quickly as possible, but B, I want to give the wood a chance and a place to expand to without making contact with the piece of wood next to it. This is really, really, really important. Um, making sure that we have, you know, expansion places. I always, I always um, use the analogy, it's like having elastic waistbands on your pants when you go to the buffet. Uh, it's, it gives you a place to put on a little bit of weight and then you're going to take it off when you're done. So as wood will dry out and it'll shrink up. If I bring wood into my house, I want to acclimate it. And there's one myth I want to dispense. Um, I was taught this a long time ago, and I always found it unique, but it makes more and more sense now. I asked way back in the 80s when I was learning this business um, why we used to tell people, and we did, we used to tell people that it took three days for the wood floor to acclimate. And I asked the guy training me, and his answer was, how long does it take a check to clear? <laughs> It all made sense then, because back then you got a third of the money when you sign the contract, a third when you drop the wood off, and a third when you put it in. It does not take 72 hours for wood to acclimate. It takes what it takes. It depends on what the moisture content of the wood is when it came into the environment. It depends on how quickly, how dense the wood is, and how quickly the moisture will either leave the wood or in accumulate in the wood to bring it up to the standard of the house or the building that it's going to function in. You want to take multiple tests when it comes to percentage of moisture. I like to check the leg of a couch, the door jam in a house. So I get, a, I use a couple of random wood items to check in a house or in a building so I know what the standard is. In South Florida, I'm looking at anywhere between 11 and 13, 14 percent when uh, I'm looking at a moisture content. So now I need my wood flooring to get up to that before I install it or darn near it before I install it. Why does this happen? Well, first things first, when the tree's alive or when you freshly cut down the tree, the mass of water in a freshly felled tree is 60 to 200% of the dry mass of the tree. So you have these, these cell pockets inside of the tree that are full of water. And then as the tree dries out, that water leaves, but those pockets are still there. Now, because there's not pressure on the pockets, the tree starts to pull in and tighten up a little bit and gets a little harder. Um, basically, though, wood will tend to achieve the equilibrium with the surrounding air and moisture content that it's in. So if it, you chop a tree down in the middle of a forest and you leave the tree in the middle of the forest right where it's at, it'll initially lose moisture and then it'll kind of balance off or equal off at the typical ambient air temperature slash humidity level in that forest. If you put it in an air-conditioned building, it'll level off at what's going on in the air-conditioned building. If you put it near a waterfall, if you put it in a, in a river, it'll equal off to that. Which, by the way, on a side note, which is why, which makes some of these um, river recovered heart pines and things like that so valuable is the sap in those trees kind of block the wood from absorbing the water and that's why they were able to survive underwater for all those years and that's what makes them one heck of a floor system. By increasing the water content of wood, you will lower the stiffness and the strength of the wood. So now by adding water back to it, I'm filling up those pockets and those lanes and those empty voids inside of that wood. When the water content of dry timber increased to levels found in the green timber, in other words, when you've added enough water to a, to a, a piece of wood that's, one, that's dried out, that was once living, was cut down, now it's dried out, now it's back up to the to the standard that it was when it was a green timber, the cell walls will fill with water. And this can cause the cell walls to expand dimensionally. Um, it's gonna get fat again. Now water softens the cell walls and the hydrogen bonds between the different polymer chains in the cellulose microfibers and it can break. It's gonna expand so much and it's gonna soften that wood up so much that it's going to, it's, it, it could, you could start getting cracks in it. So you really want to be careful about controlling the moisture, understanding where it's coming from, how it got there, um, and controlling the moisture. Um, on a side note, um, when you put a wood floor in a house, it doesn't know where it's at. 
So if the wood floor is buckling in front of the windows, it doesn't know it's in front of the windows. It has no idea it's in front of the windows. I probably would look to see if maybe there was a leak at the windows. See, when you see failures like that, they shouldn't be in patterns. Um, if it's in front of a refrigerator, it doesn't know it's in front of a refrigerator. It could be drier in front of a window in my house, for instance. Um, in, in my house, for instance, it, uh, I have a glass sliding door. I, and again, I'm South Florida, but I have all nailed down wood floors in my house downstairs. And in front of the glass sliding door that leads out to the pool, it's constantly pummeled by sunlight and it shrinks up there all the time. Um, and, and my wife is constantly going, I thought you knew about wood floors. Why is this happening? Well, I kind of know why it's happening. It's just what can I do about it is the question. I can either put curtains on the window, but it's already kind of shrunk up there because it's being heated up. It's a different heat temperature and water has lost there. Be honest with you, every now and then I missed it um, with some water just to kind of bring up the humidity level and kind of equal it out with the rest of the room. Um, when wood is exposed to air, it will either dry or pick up the moisture until its reaction occurs at an equal rate. In other words, I don't have to directly throw water on top of wood. Um, it can pick it up from the vapor or the, the humidity in the air and absorb it and bring it back in there. A change of moisture content of a piece of hardwood flooring from 0 to 28% will increase the size of the piece approximately 0.1% along the length of the board and 5 to 15% along the width of the, of the board. Unfortunately, like you or I, if we put on weight, we do not get taller because I would be about 6'3 right now. Um, we get wider and so does, so does our floors. So um, you need to just be careful and understand this. Like it, it, and, and what's funny is I just sat in a seminar about um, vinyl. I know everybody's like making a hissing noise right now, but um, when vinyl expands, it expands more lengthwise than it does widthwise because there's more of there's more product there, and so from a length standpoint. But wood though only goes widthwise on that. Um, expansion joints, you want to leave space. You don't want to smash wood floors in. I, I can't tell you like how, how many times I see guys with ratchet straps tightening up wood floors super tight around here in my neck of the woods. You don't want to do that, man. You just want it to touch. You just want to get in there, close up those, make them touch and close up, especially if the floor is acclimated to the house. Um, you don't want to smash those floors too tight because there's going to be a moment and a big problem in South Florida. We have these wonderful landscaping events called hurricanes. And when they do come in, they knock power out for three or four days. And now my house has gone from 73 degrees and 50% relative humidity because of my air conditioning to 90 degrees and 85% relative humidity. My wood floor better have a place to go to. I, li I literally have anywhere between three quarters to one inch perimeter expansion around everything in my house. I have, I have molding and shoe molding, um, quarter round, all the way around, everywhere. Um, definitely need to make sure you understand how much it's going to expand and contract. Um, what can be done? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to understand the moisture conditions on the job you're on. Um, you know, Again, hydrostatic pressure, vapor emissions, is the AC on or is the heat on? How does this react? One of the things I'm always cautious about is telling people how to do stuff, you know, in a, in nationwide because what necessarily happens in, in environments and conditions that happen here just in South Florida might not happen 300 miles up the road. It might be slightly different. Um, and it might be complete. I know it's completely different in Texas. Um, from Florida or California from Florida or Alaska or Minnesota. So there's basic principles, but also there's local principles. And it really pays to understand those local principles. I always defer to the local installers and ask them, which brings me to another point, guys. If, if you're listening to this and you're an installer, you're probably pretty good at what you do. Um, the fact that you can take the time and know that you need to take the time to do this and listen. Um, 
I just want to let you know that, man, we have got to reach out and we have got to, you know, bring in the next generation of installers that are out there. We've got to find them. And I'm going to say this out loud. Let's stop always going for the low hanging fruit. Um, go talk to kids that are in college that have an education. Um, you start talking to them about the kind of money they can make. Um, this isn't might not necessarily be a lifetime career for them, but I we need in smart, intelligent guys that can do mathematics, that can understand layouts, that can understand read technical data sheets and understand them, and aren't afraid to work a little bit. And we need to look everywhere to make sure that we are recruiting and constantly recruiting the next generation and the next generation after that of installers. Um, I'm a manufacturer. I work for a manufacturer. I'm not personally a manufacturer. I work for a manufacturer and I see so many mistakes that are self-inflicted wounds. I, it just, it, it, it hurts my heart to see installers making mistakes like that. And if they had the information in front of them, at least then I would know if they just did it on their own. But sometimes I just don't think we're doing a good enough job training the next generation. Guys and girls, get out there, go find the next generation. Let's train them up. Train your replacement. Trust me, if you're good enough, they'll never actually replace you. What do we need to know about why do we need a moisture barrier? Um, Again, I'm in South Florida. Almost everything I do is on slab, slabs on grade. At my house, for instance, my house is seven feet above mean sea level. Um, four of that feet was filled that they brought in. So basically, I live in, I, my house is built in a swamp at one point in time. Um, that swamp is in, that moisture, that water in whatever form, in a vapor or a liquid, is in the ground. And as soon as I cover over it, it's going to want to rise up. So I've got to have a vapor barrier. I've got to close the system off. Um, if I don't close the system off, there's so many things that could go wrong. Now, the one thing that I probably don't feel as comfortable about, but I do kind of understand it, is hydrostatic pressure. I don't have to deal with that. I don't have water on one side of my house or snow stacked up on one side of my house. We don't have a thing called a basement here. If we had a basement in Florida, it would be an underground swimming pool. Um, but there are other things that go on, osmotic blistering, alkali silica reaction. All of these are about the water that's in the slab or the water that's currently in the slab and rising up. The next thing we have to understand is, is that water coming through my concrete? Is my concrete sealed off at the bottom? Or is it on a, is it on a, you know, like a closed system, like a metal pan system to where moisture is not going to come up through the bottom, then all of that water that's in that concrete is there just based on when they mixed it and when they poured it. And eventually it will decrease as it's rising up and going away. But I don't know about you, I'm kind of a closet nerd when it comes to watching buildings go up and I watch all the time. I'll just pull over on the job sites and just watch them put do stuff. And you've seen what they do to moisture barriers or vapor retarders, I should call them. They poke holes in them so they can let the so the water can drain off their concrete faster and it can appear to be drying and curing faster. Ten years from now, that giant hole in my vapor barrier is going to impact the floor that I'm on top of. Um, the one thing I will say is, as a manufacturer, is all manufacturers are doing a really, really, really good job making high performance adhesives and systems to go ahead and help slow down the rate or deal with some of the rate of the moisture that's in concrete slabs. And we'll get into those in a little bit. Uh, moisture in a liquid state, look, it's rain coming from the sky. It's the water that, that comes out of your faucet. It's all of those things right there. Um, it's going to pass through concrete through capillary actions. There's pores and little gaps and openings in between there, and it can pass through there. This is where hydrostatic pressure comes in. A great example of hydrostatic pressure is take an empty five-gallon bucket and try to push it down in a swimming pool. The further down I push that bucket, the more pressure is trying to push in through the sides of the bucket. bucket and through the bottom, water wants to seek it, it wants to flatten out across that bucket, um, the water inside of there. 
fill that bucket halfway up with water and stick it into the pool. You won't feel any pressure on the bucket at all until the water line goes past the water that's inside the bucket, where the water line is inside the bucket, then you'll start to feel that pressure again. That's what's going on in your house when I have pressure on one side of my of my house and not on the other side. It's trying to fill that house up with water to the water line or to its existing water line. And so you're going to have to fight that. There are products that you can apply from inside the house um, to stop that pressure. But the best way to do that is to actually put an outdoor underground waterproof system around the perimeter of your house and that'll help prevent that pressure from coming in there. Um, in a moisture vapor state, it's simple humid air. It's, it's water that comes up through the slab in, a moist, in the form of a moisture. It passes up through that concrete slab, and it's trying to seek the lesser relative humidity. Um, I always say that we didn't have half the problems until we had air conditioning, and it's kind of true in South Florida. Um, once we once we started, almost every house had air conditioning. Then we started seeing problems with some of these older wood floors, and literally people were just you you know the the the, the theory was you couldn't put a wood floor in South Florida like it wasn't going to work. And we were all as ex as installers, we were all just like that's kind of not true because it works in some places and it doesn't work in others. We had to kind of work our way through the thing through the system. And once we figured it out, and once we figured out what was going on about crawl spaces and about the air conditioning and how to seal those off, it all got a lot better when it came to wood floors. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the older wood floors here in Florida were covered with carpeting, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting for so long, and, and they got eaten up with pet stains and stuff. They really weren't salvageable. Um, on a side note, I watch these DIY shows all the time when they're remodeling a house and trying to keep the existing floor Guys, if you need to patch a floor out in the middle of a living room, go pull the wood out of a closet. It's the same wood and patch, make the patch and then just put new wood in the closet. Who cares if you've got existing um, wood in, 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 a, in a closet or something like that? Or sacrifice one bedroom and pull all the wood out of there. And, and But some of these patches I see on TV, I'm shaking my head going, I wouldn't accept that. It doesn't look right. Um, Got to, you know, I'm sure everybody, again, I'm sure everybody on here is making the right choices um, because you're taking the time out of the day to try and listen to someone else's opinion, and that's awesome. Vapor emission scenarios. Concrete drying. Now, when I mentioned this earlier about a closed slab or above grade slab situation. When we're talking about a closed slab, what we're talking about is either a metal pan on the bottom of the slab so moisture can't get through it, or a vapor retarder on the bottom of the slab so moisture can't get through it. The slab is closed. There should be no other way other than a broken pipe um, for, for an introduction of water into the slab system. So now the moisture that's in that slab was existing from the excess water that was used when they mixed the slab up originally. Um, as buildings get older in closed slab situations, they definitely should dry out. It doesn't mean that there's no chance at all. I want everyone to understand this right now. There's always a chance. Water is sneaky, it's vindictive, and you never know how and where it's coming from. It is, it is, a, it is always trying to trick you up. Um, so you need to be one step ahead of it. Um, open slab situations are in a constant state of what's underneath passing through. So an open slab, I'm in a multi-story building, and above me, I just, I, if I pulled the ceiling tiles out, I could see the bottom of the concrete slab that's up above me. Um, that's an open slab situation. Now you would think, well, there's multiple floors up above you, you shouldn't have a problem. What if the ground floor floods? Where's that water gonna go? As it converts itself from a liquid to a vapor, it's going to rise up and it's going to start absorbing into the slab up above me. Um, never assume. I prefer to play it safe. And if customers don't want to go along with that, well, not all customers are worth having, is my theory. Um, I taught both of my kids this lesson. I'm very proud of it. At least they learned this for me. Fault and responsibility. Um, I, always I always teach it like this. If my dog jumps the fence and bites my neighbor, it's not my fault, but it's my responsibility. 
If I open up the gate and tell the dog to bite the neighbor, it's my fault and my responsibility. If I show up on a job, do not do a moisture test. Do not even mention or worry about moisture. Go ahead and install the floor, and three months later, the floor buckles due to moisture issues. It's my fault and my responsibility. Um, when I show up on a job, it's my responsibility to make sure that this job is going to meet the standards that's required to have the best possible performance out of that floor. We owe it to our reputation. We owe it to the customer who's paying us. We owe it. It's just the right thing to do. I'm sorry if it costs some money to go ahead and mitigate this or fix this. It's really not my issue. It's, it's, good. it's my issue when I accept the floor in the condition that it's in. So make sure we're testing, make sure we're being upfront with customers. Quite frankly, one of the best lines I ever heard was not everybody can have a wood floor. Um, there's just some scenarios where this just isn't gonna work. And that's okay, that's okay. Um, make sure that we, you've got yourself covered and, and that you can sleep at night about it. Who wants to be worrying about a, a job that they, took a chance on and now it's going to come up. You, you, you can do 500 jobs right. They only want to talk about the one that you did wrong. So check, check your reputation and make sure you're good to go. Um, closed slabs is where a concrete slab is isolated. A permanent vapor barrier is there. In a closed slab system, the only source of moisture is the free water originating from within the concrete itself. The impact of vapor emissions is just Flooring failures estimate about a billion dollars annually. I want to say that again. About a billion, with a B, annually. Catastrophic system failures generally, generally occur in the first years of the life cycle. Premature system failures, serviceability of floor covering, often reduced from 20 years to seven or eight years or less. I used to build, I uh, did a lot of basketball courts when I was a younger man, because that was a smart thing to do when I was younger. And the um, average life expectancy in a basketball court that we were, we were thinking about was anywhere between 40 and 60 years. There were some really, really cool old basketball courts. I, I looked at a school in South Florida, and Florida is a rel South Florida is a relatively young city. Um, the school, this floor was built in the 30s at some point, and all the game lines were hand cut in with rosewood. Um, and they wanted me to tear the floor up. I absolutely refused to tear the floor up. I left money on the table and walked off the job. I would, I was not, the floor gods would have never forgiven me for tearing that floor up. I volunteered to refinish the floor and bring it back to life. Um, they didn't want to do that. So I let someone else tear the floor, up. but it killed me. It was a beautiful floor system. Um, premature floor failures, they happen and they just, they just keep eating the floor up and eating the floor up. Um, floors, wood floors should last. They should, I have wood floors in my house now going on 20 years. It's been 15 years since I've gone ahead and, and put, refinished my floors. I'm about ready to do that now. Um, upstairs, the, my floors look pristine because I yelled at the kids about wearing their shoes upstairs and taking care of it and, and making sure you took care of the floors. When we're talking about a wood floor, we're talking about a piece of furniture slash artwork that we live on, that we don't hang it on a wall. We don't, we don't step back and look at it. We actually live on it. We walk on it. Our dogs, our children, our, our mothers, our fathers, um, our family, we live on this floor. Um, it's, um, and it's a work of art. And we've taken what was once a living thing and it has now died and we've taken that recycled it, repurposed it, brought it in, and now it's a functional floor. The advantage in Florida that I have over, everyone has marble floors here. When they walk into my house, they're like, oh, this reminds me of my mother's house in New York. Oh, it looks so good. It's so warm feeling. And it's funny, I don't have to tell people to take their shoes off. They just naturally do it. They get the feeling, I don't want to walk on this floor. I want to walk on this floor in my, in my stocking feet. I want to feel it a little bit. Um, it looks fantastic, and I, I just, I, I don't, I love marble floors, and I love beautiful ceramic floors, but it's not, they're not wood floors. It's, it's not a real wood floor. Um, industry changes, my gosh. I installed for 25, 26 years. Um, when I took the job here where I work now at Mopay, um, 
I thought I knew everything. I didn't know anything. I didn't understand the pressures that, that manufacturers are under constantly from the EPA to make stuff better, to make things go further, to make them safer, um, all of those things. And that's why there's a constant change in your patches, your self-levelers and adhesives and all kinds of products. Guys, just think back if you've been in a business for a while, 20 years ago, I didn't use a water-based adhesive to glue anything down. Everything was a solvent-based adhesive. Now, there's no such thing as a solvent-based adhesive, pretty much. Everything is water-based or moisture-cured. Um, it's a heck of a lot safer for us, that's for sure. Um, and the one thing that we want to maintain and we want to keep safe is the installer. Um, we're not getting any younger, and we got to hold out until the next, um, until the next, uh, the next level of, uh, of, of installers come in. And one more time, I'm going to reach out and just ask everybody. I don't know how to recruit the next generation, but I got to tell you guys, we got to figure it out. We have got to go out there. Talk to everybody. Don't just talk to people that you think need a job. Talk to people that already have a job and might not be happy with the job. You know as well as I do that working with your hands, taking an ugly floor and making it look beautiful and staring back, stepping back and looking at that thing and then going, I did this. And then, all right, off to the next job. Like, what a great feeling that is. Why are you going to hog that feeling? Go find someone else that gets the same goosebumps that I get when I think about that working with my hands and the pride that I get from that. We've got to find those guys. I don't know where they're at, but we've got to figure it out, man. How moisture vapor emissions passes through interior slabs is basically about RH and about temperature, and it's about converting from a liquid to a vapor. As long as that vapor barrier or vapor retarder is there, it's just going to hit it and fall back down, and it's not going to go through the system. But in, if it isn't there, we're going to have a problem. You know, I, at, at some point, you can kind of walk on jobs and just see, like on commercial buildings, I would walk, um, I would walk and um, I would see the buckets sitting on drywall buckets sitting on a floor. I would move them off to the side and see if I saw dark rings underneath there. If I did, um, you know, I, I kind of knew right away that we were going to have to get in on taking, uh, you know, moisture reading tests. Now, I want to say this about taking a moisture test. Commercial contractors aren't so aren't so against it, but when you're walking into Mrs. Smith's house and you're telling her that you need to do an RH test or a calcium chloride test, she thinks it's flooring voodoo. And we really need to just slow it down and explain it to her in terms that she would understand, not terms that you and I would understand. Um, we've got to make sure that we're getting that point across to our customers that this is necessary to find out and make sure that we're good to go on this floor. And that's all we're looking for. Don't be that guy that's constantly trying to make his money on, on change orders. A change order is a change order. If it happens, it happens, but it shouldn't be the way that you operate your business. Um, moisture vapor emissions that transport through sol soluble minerals, which condense at the surface. This is where now we start to get into pH. pH can be a real issue, um, especially when we're dealing with adhesives um, and, and wood floors. Um, a lot of adhesives, they perform their best between nine and 11. And when I start seeing pH values on floors at 13 and 14, you, you can burn your skin on something like that. Like it eats up the um, plasticizers in the adhesive and just changes the whole way that everything works. This is not where you want it to be. You have a high pH, you probably more, you have a moisture vapor issue. It's rising up through that slab and it's attacking it. We need to make sure you do a, P, a quick little pH test before you go ahead and you glue any floor down. Um, where does the high pH come from? without getting too scientific-y, that's a word I'm allowed to make them up because I'm the presenter. Um, calcium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and sodium hydroxide. You're like, whoa, that sounds serious. It's metals dissolved ions, the ions that raise up the pH level in when it's in condensation as it rises up. And it can get as high as 14, which chemically is an attacking organism. And man, it, it can ruin that floor system. If you go to the pH scale, you got to remember this is a logarithm. So it's going up in factors of 10 every single time. This is a great little slide because it shows you um, 
that shows you the different, like what different things and what their pH is. Seven is neutral. Um, so that's where you want to be. If you're at a nine, for me to get back to seven, I actually have to use something that's at about a five to get me back to a seven. Um, it's it's kind of interesting. Um, one of the best classes I ever took was a floor cleaning class where it really sat me down and explained um, neutral pH and how to get there. I thought I wasn't going to have a good time, and instead I wound up getting educated. So you never be surprised where you learn stuff at. What is dry concrete? Well, concrete isn't dry in 28 days. Concrete is cured and is only cured in 28 days. Rule of thumb is at least one month per one inch of thickness. Um, lightweight concrete mix is at a rate two times of longer than the normal concrete rate. And structural members will not generally dry in an acceptable degree in time for flooring installations. Uh, one of the things I was taught was um, it takes for concrete to get dry enough to receive product on top of it. And it takes about, um, it can take about 28 to 90 days. Um, and about 70% of the excess water that's inside of the extra water that's inside a concrete slab gets wicked off and cured in that time frame. It takes about 100 years for the last 30% to get out of there. And the reason is that these concrete spikes it look like little stars um as they as they start to dry out they pull in on them and they start drawing in and the tighter they draw in the smaller the passageway is for the water to get out and it takes longer for the water to get out and as it takes longer for the water some of the water gets out it gets even a little bit tighter and a little bit tighter and concrete's constantly in a state of pulling in on itself and getting harder and harder and harder um, if you don't believe me, go to a slab that's 28 days old. You can take a cut nail and drive it into the slab. Go to a slab that's 28 years old. You got to drill a hole to put a nail into the slab. Go to a slab that's 50 years old. You're burning up your drill bit to put the nail into the slab. Um, it just keeps getting stronger and harder and harder. Remember the floor is part of a building envelope. It's all part of a system. Leaks are not acceptable. If the floor system's good, the concrete's good, we got vapor mid, we got a vapor barrier down, it's all good to go. And the window's leaking? Really? Because then what happens is that water gets into the concrete, a closed system gets into it, and now we got to wait for it to go ahead and wick its way out of there again. I'm not going to get into the um, what tests to use, which ones don't to use it, where there's enough information out there for everyone to make the proper decision. Um, I, I, I like all the testing for years and years and years. I used calcium chloride tests because that's all there was. And then as RH tests become, became better, more viable, and more acceptable, I started using them. Quite frankly, the bigger the job, I would, I would be using both tests and documenting everything all the time, which brings me to the next point, guys. You have an advantage that most people don't have. We can take pictures of these, of these test results and what our testing as we're going along and saving them for these jobs. Um, MBR rates, moisture is measured in pounds, uh, the amount of water emitted from a thousand square foot floor in, in concrete over 24 hours. Proper testing requires one test per thousand square feet. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. You guys know it. More importantly, if you don't know it, do what I did and read it. The first time I read the actual um, ASTM F1869, I realized about 80% of the test results that I did were actually not valid based on some of the things that I never that I never really understood. So take your time read them, understand them, and follow them. As men, I know we don't do good with instructions. We need to do good. We need to do good. Um, the ASTM F2170 method for, for determining relative humidity. Everyone is feeling very comfortable with this. I'm feeling very comfortable with this. There's great representation out there. Um, there's great companies out there. Pick the one that you're comfortable with, follow it, learn about it, stay on top of it. Guys, this is changing all the time. There's always new devices coming out. Stay, be current. Uh, I've been doing it this way for 40 years, just doesn't cut it. I, now at this point, I've been doing it this way for five years, might not cut it. If you think so, just look at your cell phone. Um, five years ago, your phone probably didn't look like the one you currently have in your hand. Um, 
why RH test? It can be quickly remeasured. Um, it's easily to track drying times. There's proven accuracy and proper testing requires one test per thousand feet with a minimum of three tests. Um, why would you need a moisture barrier? My gosh, I think we just kind of covered that. I can tell you some of the failures. You, I don't remember every job I did right, but I remember every job that failed. One of my worst jobs that ever failed wasn't my fault, but again, it was my responsibility. And it was that Harco Pattern Plus job I was telling you about. And it was a restaurant of a very famous coach um, here in South Florida. And I constantly during the job smelt beer on the job and I was accusing my installers of drinking beer on the job. Come to find out, short version was, there was a beer line that ran underneath the floor and was leaking and the carbonation came through the concrete system, got trapped underneath the vapor barrier the sheet goods that we put down and created a Volkswagen sized bubble in the floor. Um, once we figured out what it was, it took about six to eight months to get all that carbonation out of the floor. And in the process, what we did was we pulled up some boards, drilled holes in them and put them back down to allow it to constantly vent. So it's look, learn, listen, read, constantly check. Um, why do you need a moisture barrier for impervious floors? Woods, wood floors are going to try and you don't want to fill those empty voids back up. You want to allow the wood to acclimate to the conditions that it's supposed to be in. And then from there, you just want the wood to relax. And remember, it's unexpected loss or gain of moisture that's going to give you a problem. As long as wood is expecting it, it can deal with it. If it's not expecting it, it cannot deal with it. The other thing, check with your manufacturers. There's some awesome, awesome adhesives and options out there. There's epoxies, there's urethane adhesives that go completely up to 25 pounds or 100% RH. There's hybrid polymers that do the same thing. There's also tapes and barriers. There's all kinds of things. Um, and, and, and a lot of the manufacturers that we're all doing great jobs and we're constantly looking. We're looking at each other. We're looking to the future. We're looking in different fields to find the next solution to these problems to prevent them. One last thing. My gosh, you guys are doing amazing work. More and more, the pictures that I see, the floors that I see, they're absolutely stunning and beautiful. Um, it shows your true craftsmanship. Go grab somebody. Let's, let's put your arm around them. Give them a hug. Let's teach them. Let's bring them into our business. Let's let them into our world. Let them know what we know. Let them know that, that we work with this beautiful thing right here called wood and that we can make it perform and do these amazing things. We've got to figure this out, guys. Summary. Assume all concrete's got moisture and, and try to prove it does until, it, until you can no longer, until you can come to the conclusion that it doesn't. Test to understand the condition of the concrete and substrate preparation is, is essential. Shortest distance between two points, anybody? I thought I heard someone say a straight line. That includes in a flat plane too. So when I have a flat floor, it just goes easier. Less material, less adhesive, less wood, it just goes easier. Guys, thank you for listening. I'll take any of your questions right now. Um, you guys are awesome. I'm proud to be part of the family of wood floor installers, man. Thank you, Sam. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you for making it so, uh, your passion just comes straight out, so thank you. We're now gonna begin answering those questions submitted today um, during the presentation and you still have time to submit some questions and Sam will be answering those questions. So the first question is from Brian and are you ready for this Sam? Um, yeah. Okay, if you are water popping a floor, could the moisture content of the wood affect how the floor reacts to the wetting process? Yeah, it could. Um, I am just, when I say misting, I am gently misting that little section in front of my glass sliding doors, but it definitely does. You can hear it, you can see it, and that is the only place on my floor, and I have stained wood floors in my house where it's, it's, it's kind of bleached out, and the water actually, uh, you can tell it's, it's been exposed to a little bit of water, at least I can. Um, I'm, I've convinced my wife it's just the sunlight, but it's not actually the truth. So yeah, you, you want to be very, very, very careful with that. You're play, I'm, I'm playing a dangerous game, but I know the wood floor guy, 
and he's pretty good, so he can figure it out. <laughs> so we have Stephen. Uh, would you ever acclimate engineered flooring pin stacked out of the box in your area, or is this yes. not necessary? It's so <laughs> that's a great question because I always wondered how in the heck is this floor acclimating if it's in a plastic bag in a box in you know and I've got the I've got the stack of wood in the house like what's happening if I've got I got a stack of wood that's 12 stacks high. What's happening in stack six in the middle row of that? How is this acclimating to the environment? A lot of times I would cut boxes open and cut the bags open to allow the atmosphere to get to it. And you want to just check, check, and check. It's it's okay to tell a customer you want to if you get the customer involved in the beginning about look this is what we're trying to achieve when we get to this point this moisture level we're good to go and you get them on board with it then it's okay but if you don't tell them that if you tell them well i'll be back in four days we'll put the floor in and then you show up and, and it hasn't acclimated to the building um there you're, you're you're disappointing the customer and they're looking for you you're the expert believe me if they could do this they would you're the expert they're looking to you to guide them guide them man hmm. uh brian has a comment i use wood from closets or other areas all the time for repair. Good advice. Sometimes wood in closets are different from wood in the rooms, though. Need to check it out. That's that's true, and that usually tells me that there probably already was an incident, and they took the wood out of the closets. In the 30s, 40s, 50s, they they didn't build like we kind of build now, where we're thinking we we can save we can save twelve dollars and forty nine cents by changing the style or the kind of wood in the closet. They built, they put in the wood floors and then built on top of them. And um, yeah, wooden closets, or I would just take a sacrificial bedroom. I would discuss it with the homeowner. A lot of times I would take the master bedroom, which was the biggest, and I would take the floor out of there and do something like I would try to match it with a modern wood, but I would give them a pattern or a design to it, just kind of upgrade their bedroom a little bit. And then I had, I'd have 250, 300 square feet of flooring that I could make repairs through the rest of the house with that matched it. So when I sanded the floor down, it looked like it had been there forever. Great. Uh, Brian also says, you are so right to always take moisture readings and site evaluation prior to floor work. I see that lacking in many of my inspections. Yeah, you want to yeah, comment you, on that? I just, you can't, I can't emphasize that enough. I, and honestly, I, you know, I, I'm sure if I lived in Louisiana or Mississippi or some of these other places, but I live in South Florida and I just, too many times, you, you can't assume there's not a, you have to assume there is a moisture issue and there's going to be a moisture issue and you got to figure out where it's at, how can I address it, how can we handle it if we can at all and, um, and then when you don't find it, you know that you've done your due diligence, you've got to do the due diligence. A, no one wants to go back, you've already gotten paid for the job, every minute I spend on a job I've already gotten paid for, I'm losing money because I'm not on the next job bidding it or making money. Um, and your reputation, how many hits can it take before it sticks? Okay. Well, we have a question from Don. What do you think of the adhesives that some manufacturers say do not require any moisture test on concrete? Well, if you got to read their instructions carefully. Um, so what they're saying is their adhesive is going to... Uh, Basically, they usually, I'm just speaking from what I know, usually they want you to flat trowel down the adhesive and create a monolithic barrier first. Then they have some sort of system to where I can put a notch. By the way, I didn't mention it, but um, my, when, when I'm gluing a floor down, I never want my notch to stick up above the bottom of my tongue. Um, that's how I can create a mess. So I want to alter the size of my trowel, whether I put a whole bunch of teeth or, or less teeth, but taller teeth. I don't ever want the notch of that trowel glue to be above my tongue. Um, so now you're going to put down a monolithic layer of a, a polyurethane adhesive in most cases, or, or a modified silene adhesive. And then you're going to put down in some sort of system with a clip or a specialized trowel, a layer of, of adhesive in a ridge section so you can glue to it. And they're counting on everything, you not leaving any voids in between there. 
And as long as you don't leave voids in between there, you won't have a problem. The problem is with me is I can't check to see if I didn't leave voids in there. I prefer if I'm gonna put a moisture barrier system down to do a two-part system, to do a moisture barrier first and then come back. In some cases, I'll flat trowel down the adhesive, let it dry overnight, then come back the next day and trowel on top of it because I can see if I've left a gap or a space. Okay, uh, Brian asks, are you saying dry concrete takes longer to dry than true cement? That slide went too fast. It did, but I was running out of time. I was looking at my watch, so I apologize <laughs> about that. Um, what I'm saying is a dry concrete can get wet again. Um, and I'm saying as concrete dries, because you got to remember, curing is the first thing it does. That's the growth of the cement particles inside of there, and they're locking together. And now the next thing is that extra water. We add about 30% more water than what is necessary to activate the cement particles and make them work. So now the rest of the history of the life of that concrete slab is trying to squeeze out without any introduction to any new water at all, trying to squeeze out that last 30% of that water. Now, 70% of that 30%, it sounds like a math question in school, um, will evaporate in about 28 days, but it, it takes about 100 years for that last 30% of that to come out. Okay, uh, Jack says, in reports, I never see inspectors test their water before taking a pH test. Opinion? What's your opinion? Yeah, I probably would test the water, but for the most part when there's, I mean, yeah, you got to kind of do that to understand where it's at, or you can make the mathematical adjustment if you have a high pH water or low pH water. It all boils down to this. I can tell you as a manufacturer, we base it, we don't, it's not that rigid that like, you know, if something was a half a percent off or something like that, that it wouldn't work. If you can drink the water, you can test with it and you can work with the water. You can't drink it. But but in a test, I mean, in a, um, if I'm doing a test and I'm, and I'm writing a report, there's much scientific information that I can put in there is going to help determine a possible cause. And also, every time you do a scientific report, you're building a case for what can go wrong. And if you notice a trend that you didn't ever think was there, you'll notice it by looking at 15 or 20 reports and if they keep saying, well, the water pH was X. Um, maybe that's the problem, or maybe we're not getting a true pH reading. Maybe, you know, it's just anything, you should always scientifically put everything that can be repeatable and empirical, and you should always put it in a report. Well, Tom remarks about that. I use distilled water for pH tests, and I test each new bottle I use. Yeah, and that's technically, that's what, you know, if you read the instructions for it, that's what they want you to do. Okay. There are some uh, other comments on here, but I'm going to go on to um, Brian's. Brian just mentions manufacturers often tell you exactly how to acclimate their product. So um, you were mentioning that. Um, there's a yeah, comment here. Well, I'm sorry. They... Go yeah. on. I'm sorry. Yeah, so manufacturers do, um, but there's always like some caveat about, you know, they want to make sure um, that, uh, you know, you, that the, the, the ambient temperature is 72 degrees, 50% relative humidity. Like you don't ever know what's going on on a job site. You don't know. So there is no like every time you do this, it'll work standard in our business. You're dealing with a product that once was alive and now it's not. You're dealing with a substrate. You don't know what's going on that, that reacts differently in September than it does in March. Um, there's a lot of moving parts here that we're dealing with. Hmm. Okay, and uh, Don says, I know of one manufacturer that states no need to acclimate. The wood is pre-acclimated and sealed in plastic wrap to tolerances between 30 to 50 percent and 60 to 80 degrees. What do you think of that? Okay, well, I'll tell you what I know. Well, good for them if they're not having claims. Um, I, I'm of the apprentice. I was always taught that most engineered wood floors come out in the box at 6.5% and they wrap them up. If I opened up and installed a 6.5% wood floor in South Florida right now, um, within three days that floor would be buckled. So, because it needs to be 11 to 13%. So, I need a 
let that floor almost double in and, and, and take on some moisture. And, and, but there's always new technology. And, you know, I always I have a policy, um, know what you know, know what you don't know, and check on both of them all the time. Um, everything that I know today, tomorrow might might not be valid because some new technology comes out, and now I've got to you know update my game. Uh, Scott asks, "What is the easiest adhesive for engineered hardwood overall to use with easy cleanup during and after, especially if the installer gets some on the surface and it dries to the surface? We have a lot uh, of installers, and not everyone is a clean installer." Same question for LVP, but um, adhesive. I was one of those guys. I, I like I would think to, like to think of myself as clean, but um, there was opportunity. So let's that's, that's a really good question. Here's my if I use a over a wood substrate, if I use a polyurethane um, adhesive, and I have to make a repair, I'm going to tear that substrate up. Um, sometimes I want to put a sacrificial wear layer over top. You want to be careful with polyurethane adhesives. Polyurethanes love the bond too. Polyurethanes. Well, what's our finishes made out of? That's on top, polyurethanes. You want to clean them up right away. The more moisture that's in the air, the faster that polyurethane is going to react. The less moisture that's in the air, the longer you're going to have. But either way, you've got about a half hour to get that polyurethane off of that wood floor before you go ahead and you clean it before it becomes an issue. Um, modified silenes will not etch into the surface. They'll, they'll, you can come back three months later, although I'm not suggesting that, but you could come back later and clean them up and they will not etch into the finish. But they're slightly more expensive and you don't have quite the open time that you have like with a polyurethane. Any water-based finish will not permanently stick to the top but you just want to be a clean installer. How do I do that? Or how did I learn to do that? I snapped the lines. I only spread glue between the lines. The lines were based on how wide my wood was and how far I could reach. Um, I, don't, I, I, I don't want to, if I'm going to continue on to the next row and I had, let's just say four inch boards, I would snap a line 21 inches. That would give me an inch past the last board of adhesive so I didn't have to back the edge of the trowel up against the tongue as I continued on spreading the next row. There's just lots of little tricks you can use, but you just got to change rags. You got to clean up. You got to stay clean. Um, you got to go as fast as you can and still be clean at the same time. And sometimes that means you just got to slow down a little bit. Uh, Patrick says, we all know a narrow board, a solid board works better than a wider one. What's your opinion on a glue down to concrete? I do glue downs. I've done glue downs, but when I get past five inches on, con then I need to know for sure I don't have any issues um, with moisture. The other thing is a five inch, six inch glue down. Ah, gosh, I want to. I don't want to bang that floor in too tight. I want to give that board a chance and place to expand to. I prefer not to go that wide. I've done up to 14 inch boards on a floor, um, Brazilian walnut boards on a floor that was a glue down and we had to tap on the boards down in place also. We plugged them. So it just depends on the job scenario, the what, what the building's going to be used as. You got to remember a lot of homes in South Florida are people's second homes and so they leave for the, they leave for the summer and shutter the house up. And I tell them, if you're going to put a wood floor in here, you better have that air conditioning on during the summertime, at, you know, at least keeping the, you know, around 78 degrees and keeping the humidity out of the, out of the room. Otherwise, when they come back for the winter time, that floor is going to be buckled and blown up. Hmm. Um, I, I believe the last uh, comment here or question is from Stephen, and he says, I've been in the game for 30 years. And this is by far the best, most informative, and most passionate presentation I've heard to date. I originally hail from, hail from South Africa and would like to share this presentation with them for the benefit of the industry back there, if that's okay. It's good with me. Okay. Um, any other questions? Um, I guess that would be it. So I want to thank you, Sam. 
um, for such a great presentation. Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar sponsored by MAPEI. If you have any other questions, please contact okay. MAPEI. And Sam, could you put that screen up? Thank yeah. you. Uh, with that information found on this screen right here. Once yeah. you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation. We would appreciate it if you would complete it to provide your feedback. And you will also receive a follow-up email within 24 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. So NWFA will continue to host free webinars on the second Wednesday of each month from 2 to 3 Central Time with an occasional webinar on the fourth Wednesday of the month. So be sure to register for the next webinar on November 13th, presented by Washington University, who will be presenting on the topic of ergonomics and is entitled Head, Shoulders, Knees and Back, Knees and Back. Each webinar is worth one continuing certification unit in maintaining your certification requirements. So on behalf of NWFA and MAPEI, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sam. Nah, thank you so much.